Yeah, I'm happy to say a few words and then hand it off to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's, you know, there's an awful lot that we went through today. To sum it all up is maybe a bit of a challenge. Um, maybe I'll just highlight a couple things that I saw and heard. Uh, appreciated, you know, the opening session that we had with the representatives from PERF and the Sing Institute. Uh, many, many important things were said in that thing. I, the thing that stood out to me, I think, was no matter what we do, as we implement and it was, as we innovate and get creative, uh, buy-in is important and uh, engaging stakeholders is important. These are, these are not new lessons. These are not new items of information, but I think in some instances, a little bit of redundancy is a good thing and it is good to reflect on, the, remember those things. I think, you know, the research uh, session that I listened in on, uh, in one sense, it was, uh, you know, things that we have kind of learned all along over the last 10 or 12 years or so. And there's, there's an awful lot of research out there. The findings are not always consistent or convergent. And so it is a bit of a job to make our way through the different findings about what's effective and what's not and what seems to have an imp what impact the cameras seem to have and what they don't. So, you know, we again, we, we, we heard from several researchers on the findings that they're coming up with. I want to mention two things about that, maybe three. Almost regardless of the type of research that's done, when there are significant findings, the real challenge for all of us is this translation piece. Getting the research and the scientific findings in the hands of the people who need to know that information in ways that make, make, they can make good use of it. I think we've made a lot of progress in that area, but there's clearly some work to be done, and uh, there's a good focus on that during that session. Uh, also, a very interesting presentation on um, uh, looking at the individual officer level factors that seem to influence whether they an officer will, will activate a camera. Fascinating thing to me, um, and maybe it's just me is that there were very few individual level factors that seem to make a difference in patterns of activation or deactivation. So it's not the officer, him or herself, that seems to be making the difference here. There could be something about the incidents, there could be something about the training, there could be something about the department culture, that's all fair game. But when some credible researchers went and looked at many, many, many incidents to see if there were officer level factors that influenced they did not come up with much other than to notice that gender seemed to make a difference. Uh, John picked up on that during that session, and I think that's something that's certainly worth looking into further. The fact that uh, for this one study seems like male officers were more likely to activate than female officers, and that's just you know something that's interesting, almost compelling, and something that bears a you know I think a lot more inquiry. I'll just say. Maybe one or two other things. A lot of interesting issues came up in the session on uh, piloting and testing. Maybe one of the most interesting things I picked up on uh, is that there was at least one agency that had their legal people working with the vendor directly to create um, a system and a contract that would work for them. I thought that was maybe a little creative and maybe a little interesting. Uh, a lot of commentary there about the importance of including prosecutors in those testing phases, finding a program champion, and uh, something that's near and dear to my heart. The notion that uh, people should engage in research early on in the process during these piloting and testing phases. So I won't say much about Laura McElroy's presentation just because it was so compelling and so good and everybody ought to have a plan, right? That's her message, have a plan. Let me stop it there, um, turn it over to John. I, I'll make one other mention on this research topic. I'm not sure it came up during the session, but Mike White and his colleagues have put a great amount of effort into what, what they call their research guides that will help those of you who are trying to make your way through the 20 or 30 or 40 studies on body-worn cameras that seem to have uh, different types of findings. So if you want to just find a way to help wade through the, you know, all the research information that's being put forward. I'd recommend going to the TTA site and finding those research guides. They'll be helpful. Other than that, 
uh, maybe a few little technical gl glitches today. I would just was pleased with the way the whole thing went, with the flow of the meeting, with the participation. Uh, I want to thank our participants and presenters. I think everybody was very well prepared for this. And um, maybe I've said too much, but John, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to you. Thanks, Chip. I, I think you sort of covered the breadth of the sessions well and the tremendous amount that was presented. And I think um, a lot that we all learned from. I think one of the themes that I'd want to emphasize is just you know, how do we better leverage the body worn camera footage? Mike White pointed out when we were doing the digital evidence management work and having our meetings that probably a very small percentage of video gets viewed, maybe um, one to 5% gets viewed in an audit or compliance check or gets sent to a prosecutor and a very, very small fraction makes its way to court, but yet there's value in that data. So that's one of the reasons why we created the demonstration projects in 2022. And I think as we saw today, uh, we're starting to see the fruits of that labor. Um, with respect to some of the constitutional policing and training projects. Um, I think we'll learn a lot. Uh, we learned this morning uh, that there is uh, one solution called POLIS that's out there um, being offered. There's also a solution called Trulio. It's sort of commercial efforts to try to um, use machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing to get the most of body-worn camera footage. So I'm not endorsing either one of those. Um, one is um, being, is part of the POLIS solution as part of a research project that's being done through our sister agency, NIJ, so uh, with the Dallas Police Department. So we've supported those, the sort of digital evidence exploitation and improving dead digital evidence management in categories three to five with 10 sites, um, some of which we've heard from today. Uh, in the upcoming weeks, uh, probably before the end of the month, we'll be announcing six more awardees under those demonstration categories, as well as some of our new grantees. Um, I think the thing that uh, struck me in the last session was, you know, both Rochester PD and LAPD want to show exemplary examples of officers doing things right. Uh, part of that process also will, you know, expose some situations, you know, of officers not doing things right. I'm thinking of the you know, common adage, we're learning from our mistakes. And I think the theme that runs through this, and I think everything with body worn cameras is, you know, they've been accepted um, by and large, by law enforcement, by the public, by advocacy groups, and that remains the fact today. I think what we need to be careful of and watchful of, particularly with respect to police um, acceptance and promotion of body-worn cameras, is that we don't turn these into gotcha moments. So I know that um, a lot of agencies are showing body-worn camera footage and using it for training purposes um, it's important while doing that, that, you know, the idea is emphasized that it's not a punitive perspective. You know, there are instances where officers violate policy and they should be held accountable, but officers um, are operating under a lot of stress, particularly in critical incidents and other stressful situations. So we know they're going to make mistakes and we just need to be careful as we're doing that. that we, we need to make sure that, um, that the body-worn camera footage is sort of use as a learning environment, not a punitive environment, and not to make officers look bad, I think, because some of, some of our hard work can uh, quickly backfire if we don't maintain that assurance. I think, you know, I'm sure we'll learn much more over the next couple of days, but um, the good thing about these sessions is I always realize I have more homework to do. Um, I think, you know, internally DOJ, um, can work more closely together. I try to keep in contact with NIJ and what they're doing. And today I learned from Adrian that I probably should be reaching out to the COPS office to see what that study was on written reports of use of force, how you've exploited um, sort of that data uh, to improve practice. So I'll be reaching out to my colleagues at COPS sometime after this session. So with that, again, I wanna thank everybody for their participation. 
Brittany and her team for putting together all the logistics. Um, Chip, men Chip mentioned a few technical issues, but um, I think this has really gone smoothly and uh, it's a testament to sort of everybody working together. And we've captured it all on video. So uh, we'll use this as an exemplary learning experience for future sessions. So thanks all, we'll see you tomorrow. So with that, have a good evening, good afternoon, and we'll see you all tomorrow.